running. So I would like to um, introduce our plenary speakers for today. And I'll start by giving you a literature citation. Terry Irwin, 1982, title, Tropical Forests, Their Richness in Coleoptera and Other Arthropod Species. Journal, The Coleopterous Bulletin, volume 36, two short pages. To say that this short paper is influential is a major understatement. We believe that Terry's paper has by far the most citations of any paper ever published in the Coleopterous Bulletin, and it helped jumpstart a global discussion on the true diversity of life on Earth, as well as the major gaps and shortfalls in our taxonomic knowledge of global biodiversity. Fast forward to last year, 2019, at the Entomological Society of America meeting in St. Louis, where there was a wonderful symposium organized by Dr. David Wagner on insect decline in the Anthroposphere. So I was there and I thought that would be a great general topic for the Coleoptera Society membership to see. Fast forward to this year, 2020, when I saw a paper titled, The Irwin Equation of Biodiversity from Little Steps to Quantum Leaps in the Discovery of Tropical Insect Diversity with Dr. Carlos Garcia Robledo as the first author, and Dr. David Wagner as one of the co-authors. Unfortunately, we lost Terry right around the time when this paper was published. He will be dearly missed. We thought there, were, there would be no better achievements than have both of these authors as plenary speakers at our annual meeting of the Coleoptera Society this year. Dr. Carlos Garcia Robledo is an assistant professor in the Ecology and Evolutionary Biology Department at the University of Connecticut, where he studies the ecological and evolutionary consequences of global change on plant arthropod interactions. And Dr. David Wagner is a professor at the same, in the same department at the same institution, where he studies the biosystematics of Lepidoptera and invertebrate conservation. I am very pleased to have you both presenting as our plenary speakers. And Carlos, I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Andrew, thank you so much. So this is great. And this is such a honor to, to be invited to give this plenary talk in what I think was Terry's favorite, one of his favorite yeah, societies. And today I'm gonna to talk about Terry, Terry Irwin. So, a plant explorer, uh, a tropical explorer, a visionary, a friend, and my postdoctoral advisor. So I don't want to talk about the many accomplishments of Terry during his career. I just put here some examples of the different papers, the different publications uh, that focus on Terry's uh, accomplishments. And we, as you said, Andrew, we miss him so much, but what I want to do today is to talk about a project that we were working uh, about this year, but it's about that famous paper in the Coleopteris Bulletin. So Terry Irwin was a California beach baby. That's one way of us to define Terry. And then when he graduated from his undergrad, he, he decided to move to cold Canada, to Alberta, uh, to join the laboratory of famous legendary coleopterist George Ball. And after a postdoctoral uh, a short time at Harvard University, they rejoined the Department of Entomology at Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History, where he served as a curator for almost 50 years. And when he was there, he got an invitation that changed his life. The, he got this invitation to go to this tropical island that is in the middle of the Catoon Lake that is called Baro Colorado Island. There is a tropical field station in Panama. And the idea was that Terry was gonna go there as, a, as, as a, one of the people trying to figure out how to measure the abundance of arthropods uh, in the canopy. And it was to calculate the biomass of arthropods in a study that was trying to understand the, the diet of silk and eaters. But this was actually really interesting because he wanted to actually figure out how to estimate this biomass in the canopy. And he came up with this idea. Maybe what, can I, what he could do was to get this fogger, this 
fungus that is used to fumigate uh, trees in orchards, and then use some sort of uh, insecticide that is biodegradable, permethrin. And then what you do is that you can fumigate the whole tree, and then you put the starts at the bottom, and then you get many, many, many insects from the canopy, and then you can calculate the biomass. And then what he discovered was that actually he was getting this rain of arthropods that originally he thought that they were really, really rare. For example, carabid beetles that were like in, present in collections by uh, represented by only one specimen. And then he had this rain of those specimens. Actually, they were canopy insects. That was amazing. So this actually was a revolutionary technique that now we all call canopy fogging. And then after this, Terry started working on these studies of how to estimate biodiversity in places like, for example, the Peruvian Amazon or Panama, or even till last summer, he went every single summer to the field to Yasuní National Park in Ecuador. So eventually in 1981, Terry received a letter from Peter Raven. At that point, uh, Peter Raven was the director of Missouri Botanical Garden. And in the letter, Peter Raven asked him a really straightforward question. How many species of insects are there in one acre of rich tropical forest? And then what Terry did was to explore Raven's, Raven's query by using his records uh, of insect collection from tropical rainforest canopies in the canal zone in Panama. As Terry said, told me, what he did was that he went to his office. He said, this is an interesting question. He took a calculator from his desk, started calculating, okay, so if I go this number of individuals that are from given species that are supposed to be specialists for one species of tree, Loea semani, that is a Malbasi, and then we have this number of trees in the tropics, then we can calculate the number of species of insects in the tropic. And then he's like, wow, this is interesting. That's an interesting number. So what he decided was to use that really simple, as he calls him this, as he used to call it this naive calculation uh, to write the paper that Andrew was talking about. This short paper, page and a half, Tropical Forest, the, rich, the Richness in, trop in Coleoptera and or Arthropods, published in the Coleopteris Bulletin. And Terry sent this paper to the Coleopteris Bulletin. I thought it's like, it's an interesting idea, but he didn't think that it was gonna be anything really uh, noticed by many people. Here you can see, as Andrew said, the total of citations till, uh, till yesterday for this paper is over 1,400 citations. Boom, right? This paper where he proposed that there might be as many as 30 million species of insects uh, started an era of biodiversity exploration. Okay, and this is me meeting Terry almost 40 years after that. I used to be the teaching assistant for courses in the field uh, uh, given by the, tropic, uh, uh, the Organization for Tropical Studies, and Terry used to be a, a professor in those courses. So I met Terry in Peru when I was just finished my undergrad, and eventually went to did, and did my PhD at the University of Miami on theoretical ecology, demography, uh, population dynamics. And then after that, I applied to one of the Smithsonian fellowships at Smithsonian, with Terry as my advisor, because we wanted to work on different questions on how climate change will affect plant herbivore interactions. Uh, and that project is still running. That's kind of like the core project in my laboratory. So what was very exciting of interacting with Terry is that Terry always had this amazing imagination. And he was always thinking about the big picture. What is the next thing in tropical biology, right? Uh, we used to go to his house and then he, together with his uh, wife, neotropical ornithologist, Racer Bad, had this house that was this hub for tropical biologists that just stop in Washington, D.C. And then you go there and then you have wine and then you talk to all these people from all over the world and you, you just think about crazy ideas. What is going to be the next big thing happening? And in one of those conversations, we we're talking with Terry about a project that is called the Search of Extraterrestrial Intelligence, the SETI project. And what we have here in this picture is Frank Drake at that point in 1961, he was a professor at Cornell University and this astrophysicist wanted to know if there was intelligent, li intelli intelligent life beyond earth in the galaxy and how can you actually detect life out of this planet. And for that, he started a project that he called SETI, the Search for Intelli Extraterrestrial Intelligence. 
and he started and he planned a first meeting for this project in 1961. They got together, kind of like this collectors bulletin, a uh, collector society meeting, right? You get together on one side. At that point, he said that it was going to be in the Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia. And then he flew a bunch of scientists, but also artists, philosophers, to discuss how can you detect intelligence in the galaxy out of Earth, but also how, what are the implications of intelligent life beyond our planet? And here are two of the 10 participants of this first SETI meeting. So we all know Carl Sagan, astrophysicist that at that point was a professor at Cornell University. And also another participant was John Lilly, who was a philosopher, an inventor, and also he was an expert in non-human communication. The big issue was that Drake did not have a program for the meeting. The meeting was in one week and he didn't know what to do in the meeting, so he didn't have a program. So what he decided was to actually to write an equation to guide the discussion of the meeting, and it is what we call now the Drake equation. And the Drake equation is a probabilistic argument to estimate the number of extraterrestrial civilizations in the Milky Way. And it is a probabilistic argument where, for example, if you want to know the number of technological advanced civilizations in the Milky Way, you need to know this multiplication of probabilities of different requirements for this to happen, right? So first you need to have, know the rate of formation of stars in the galaxy. Then you need to know the fraction of those stars that actually can have planets around. Then you have the number of planets per solar system that are suitable for life. Then the few, the few of those planets that actually will produce life. Then the fraction of those planets that will produce intelligent life, then which of them will develop some technology that we can actually detect from Earth. And then finally, the length of civilization. And then if you have this probabilistic argument, then you can estimate how possible or less possible is to actually like have intelligent life beyond Earth. For example, if you have civilizations that are able to produce technology that we can detect, but they disappear quickly, then it will be very unlikely for us to identify them or maybe we're just alone in this galaxy. But if these events are not rare and civilizations can live a long time or you can have many planets uh, that are suitable for life, then maybe you, they, uh, using this, uh, this argument of this equation, you can assume that maybe it is somewhat certain that there is a intelligent life beyond Earth. Now, Please remember that the purpose of the Drake equation was to stimulate scientific dialogue, not to give an accurate estimate of, civilization in our, uh, of civilizations in our galaxy. Okay, so we were having this conversation and then I told Terry, Terry, that's, that approach sounds very similar to your call to this bulletin paper, right? And this happened when I was, I think I was in Costa Rica doing some research and we, I gave, gave him a quick talk and we were talking about this idea, right? Only, that your probabilistic argument is verbal, right? So, okay, so what I thought is that I am also a coleopterist and I love taxonomy. However, I already named a bunch of different beetle species for my advisors. So what I decided with my students here at the University of Connecticut was that in our laboratory, we were gonna name an equation after Terry, the Erwin equation of biodiversity. So here is a team, a team of researchers in my laboratory, students, postdocs, my favorite colleague, colleague and wife that is also a professor here at the University of Connecticut. And then what we decided is that we were gonna read Terry's argument, and then we were gonna transform that argument, that verbal argument into the equation of biodiversity. And one thing that I noticed when I was working on this presentation was that, uh, in all the previous slides, there was a very limited human diversity, mostly males, right? I don't know if everybody knows that, right? So I'm really glad that actually I was able to put together this slide showing that if you want to understand diversity, we need to actually have human diversity. Okay, so to improve our team, we invited uh, the Wagner is our next speaker. So now we have an even more diverse uh, group of 
uh, researcher for this project. Actually, what happened was that uh, I was having a couple of beers with Dave, and then we were talking about this idea of the Drake equation and how this could be analogous to this idea of the Erwin equation, and they thought that it was super interesting. So what we decided to do was to have this short project that was going to be one semester where part of our lab meetings, that our weekly lab meetings, were going to be devoted to think about how to estimate biodiversity. Okay, so because I'm one of the associate editors of Biotropica, the, the Journal of the Association for Tropical Biology and Conservation, uh, I propose this topic as a, pot a potential topic for one of the 50th anniversary uh, celebratory papers coming in Biotropica this year. And we call it the Erwin Equation of Biodiversity from Little Steps to Quantum Leaps in the Discovery of Tropical Insect Diversity. The idea was to generate the Erwin Equation and then after that, with my students, what we did was to revise the different models to estimate diversity. And then we use, we, we were able to, to trace the parameters from all the different equations to link them to the original idea of theory. And it was amazing that we discovered that actually many of those models can be directly connected to the basic idea that was proposed by Terry in this short paper in the Coleopteris Bulletin. So here we have the Erwin equation of biodiversity. That is a probabilist, prob probabilistic argument to estimate the number of insects in the tropics, where we have the number of insect species can be calculated if we know the fraction of herbivorous species, the fraction of predatory species, the fraction of fungible species, you can continue doing the, the scavenger species that are specialized in a given plant and of course, if you know the number of plants in a tropical rainforest, then you can calculate the number of species. And of course, you have the same issue, right? You have the argument can be somewhat accurate or extremely uncertain, depending on how well you know these parameters. And as we know, knowing these parameters is super difficult. For example, we have the parameter here, LK, that we have here. Uh, let me see if I have my laser pointer. The parameter LK, that is the total number of known insects. How can we know that, right? So basically the confidence intervals can be huge. So I want to remind you that actually the Erwin equation of biodiversity is, the purpose is to stimulate scientific dialogue, not to give an accurate estimate of the number of species. So if you visit our paper, you will find a taxonomy of the different methods to estimate diversity. And there's only one of them, right? So these are called the, the Erwin equation is a diversity ratio method where you can estimate the number of species based on some trophic level. Then Robert May produced a similar equation where he actually was able to include a parameter where he was able to include a, how variables can be the different parameters, right? The sensitivity of those parameters of change and then Odegaard include another parameter that is actually how diversity changes in space. So that's called beta diversity, right? So how can you include beta diversity to actually calculate how many species? And then you can go on and on, right? And there are many other ways of calculating uh, the number of species. You can have, for example, uh, macroecological methods. You can use a relationship, relationship with body size, biogeography. You can use discovery curves, right? You have the higher taxa approach that are these regressions where you can actually calculate the, the, the amount of effort to, uh, to, to discover species versus uh, the, 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 the different slopes of the different lines for the different uh, samplings and so on, right? And of course, one that is super important and is the only way that you can actually have some estimation of biodiversity is experts. So all of you, if we don't have experts for many groups, we won't be able to even like fathom which, what is, what, what, how many species are uh, on Earth. So a second goal for this project was to try to find estimates for different groups of insects. And then we chose only six, the six major orders of insects, Coleoptera, Hymenoptera, uh, Diptera, and so on, right? So we have them here. And we searched in the literature for the number of described species, the minimum number of estimates, the maximum estimate for those species. And then we produce what we call a species scape. How many species are described 
the minimum estimate and the maximum estimate. And I want you for this presentation to just focus on the maximum estimate. Coleoptera, we have over 2 million species. Hymenoptera, this is uh, on about 1 million species. Diptera, 800,000 species, and so on, right? So what we did with this is, uh, to obtain these estimates was to look at the literature, but also contact experts. And because these estimates depend on a literature search and expert uh, opinion, we have a log that is a companion of the paper. So you can trace the origin of all these different numbers that of course they can change, right? Okay. So while Erwin's estimate of 300 million insects has been abandoned for decades, it is far too early to regard it as dead. Molecular methods combined with uh, global insect surveys are unveiling vast cryptic diversity. And micro, micro dipterans and wasps alone have the potential to push global insect diversity well beyond our upper limit of 8.8 .8 million, perhaps 20 million or beyond. And that's what is going to be our next uh, talk by Dave Wagner. When asked if his 3 million estimates uh, was correct, they were used to laugh and said, actually, my estimate may be very, very conservative. Okay, Terry was at core an entomologist and a coleopterist. But if you ask him how, how he defined himself, he would say that he was a carabidologist. He studied carabid beetles. And he, his preferred genus was the genus Agra. And Terry's sense of humor often made itself apparent in the names that he gave to new species of his favorite genus of carabid beetles, Agra. So we have, for example, the species Agra cadabra, Agra menon, Agraphobia, or Agravation. And of course, he also named Agra species after some like uh, famous people, right? For example, this species was uh, named after the survivor of the sinking of the Titanic. Or here we have Agra leaf, that is after this famous actress daughter of uh, the, 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 the lead singer of um, whatever. Okay, but this one is super interesting, right? Here we have this beetle that he found and he had these really thick femurs. And of course, after he found this beetle, he decided to call uh, to name it after Agra, uh, after Arnold Schwarzenegger. And actually Terry got a letter from Schwarzenegger thanking him for naming this species after him. Okay. And this is my favorite species. This is Agrograce, named after my lifelong friend, Razor Bat, tropical ornithologist, Terry's wife, and lifelong companion. In Terry's words, the epithet Grace is an eponym based on the given name of the Peruvian ornithologist, Razor Bat, who, uh, who has shared the bird infested Amazon and Andes with me for many years. Okay, so back in 1961, at the end of the SETI meeting, scientists started a program to search for life all over the galaxy. The 10 participants dubbed themselves as lifetime members of the Order of the Dolphin because of John Lilly's work on dolphin communication. So during this Collectorist Bulletin, Collectorist Society meeting, I would like to summon you all as members of the Order of the Agradables. Agradable means nice and likable in Spanish. And on behalf of Terry, I would like to thank you all for your efforts to discover and conserve life in this planet. Wait a minute. By the way, Terry told me how many insects are in the tropics. Gazillions. <laughs> thank you very much.
while Dave is getting set up, maybe I'll just mention if you have any questions for either speaker, you can continue to put them in the Q&A. Thank you. I'm ready to start if, if you guys are. Go ahead, Dave, you're live. Okay. So I was going to use my time to talk a little bit about some of the new data that's coming out about how many insects there might really be in the world, as opposed to basing many of our estimates on what is known. And we all know that uh, basically much of entomology is based on what we know from the northern hemisphere and uh, particularly the, the temperate zone. And as we're getting more data and as we're getting more molecular data, things are changing. I'm going to divide my talk into two parts. I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes about some of this new data that's coming out, particularly some of the barcode data, and then um, switch over and talk about insect decline a little bit since I've been involved in that in the last couple of years and thought I could share some of that uh, with you all. So um, here's where we are at in 2018. This is the annual review article that Nigel Stork put together. He's a beetle person, as many of you know, and based on his best estimates, uh, he was thinking that there might be 100 or uh, 1.5 million species of beetles, perhaps 5.5 million insects, and 7 million arthropods. And that he kind of didn't think a whole lot of these ideas that there might be as many as 10 million or 20 million or 30 million species as Terry was just guesstimating it. And again, that was a research agenda. I, I don't think that there, Terry spent a whole lot of time. Um, it, it was mostly to provoke research and uh, get other people to collect data. And it, it was really a sort of a back of the envelope calculation. And uh, I guess there was another part of Star, Star, Stork's uh, publication talking about the number of species that yet uh, that need to be described or had not been described yet. And uh, he was thinking that there might be 80% uh, left undescribed. And as you can see uh, in the next couple slides, we're gonna uh, change that a little bit. That his ideas might've been a little, a little too conservative. So anyway, some of the new data that's coming out and is suggesting that Hymenoptera in particular uh, might be considerably more diverse uh, than we thought before. And this is a paper that came out in 2018. And it was basically a calculation based on the host specificity of of various hymenoptera across five different orders of insects. And the idea was that um, at, at least across a very large data set, the average beetle was hosting or insect was hosting perhaps two to as many as nine different hymenopterans. And if this were in fact the case, then the total number of hymenoptera could greatly exceed the number of described species for beetles. And, and this was basically just uh, uh, an extrapolation based on host specificity. In some ways, analogous to what Terry had done with herbivorous beetles. This is some of the barcode data that's starting to come out. This is a million specimens, a million insects that were collected across Canada from malaise traps. And in the left-hand column here, you can see that most of the insects collected from the malaise traps were Dipra, uh, only about 47,000 of the million insects were coleopterans. And the next largest group from the malaise traps were hymenopterans. This is a plot that shows from this same study by Polly Bear and his colleagues. It's, it's the number of known species versus the number of bins. And uh, the whole point here is that uh, from these million specimens that they looked at are trapped from malaise traps all over Canada, there was roughly uh, a one-to-one -one correspondence or close to it for uh, the number of described species and the number of bins that were recovered. But uh, the two green points at the top are where you start to see the discrepancy, where they're getting a lot more bins than they are a number of known species. And uh, because this is a logarithmic scale, uh, this is quite a bit of cryptic diversity that's being discovered in this malaise trap program. So this is the data taxonomic breakdown 
of the different groups. And uh, Dipra by far, in fact, overwhelmingly were the predominant insects in this malaise trap program that they did with Hymenoptera uh, coming in second and uh, Coleoptera lagging behind a little bit. And, and we can talk about why that might be the case, uh, but I, I wanna get to their conclusions because it's I, I don't have much time and it's pretty fascinating actually. Uh, it's just extraordinary. So they ended up with about 46,000 species uh, or barcode species I should say, and we're all suspicious about that, but some people would have us believe that there's actually more species uh, than you recover with barcodes, uh, particularly when you get very specialized or recently derived taxa. But in any case, uh, the big number here, and maybe something to take home that I think is fascinating, is that um, there was just an extraordinary number of Cecidomyids. And they go on to extrapolate that there might have been um, what, you know, maybe maybe these 16,000 species, if we extrapolate beyond that, given that Canada has about 1% of the global diversity or of the known global diversity of insects, this would translate to about 1.8 million species of Cecidomyidae globally. And this seems like an absolutely novel, ridiculous thing. But I, I, I wanna tell you that the, the same results have uh, recently turned up from Germany as well, uh, placing Cecidomyidae far, far out in front of all other insect families in terms of species diversity. And uh, this is this is going to be fun for for me to share with you guys. Dan Jansen sent this data two days ago uh, and wanted to share it with you. So this is from his malaise trap uh, program in Costa Rica. He's very interested in barcoding the entire fauna and flora, every single organism in Costa Rica. And you'll hear more about that over the course of the next couple of years. But this is his BioAlpha project, and he's looking for ten million dollars for ten years to sequence everything in Costa Rica and, and towards that end, he's starting with malaise traps. And just from seven, seven traps in Costa Rica in the Northwestern part in Guanacaste, he's got about 25,000 bins of different insect taxa. And again, this would be primarily flying insect taxa. And uh, the, the important thing to keep in mind here, and I don't really have the data, but I can convey it to you is that there's tremendous beta diversity. In other words, if you run two malaise traps, even a kilometer apart, there's very little overlap in the species catch. And so um, he's, he's got, again, uh, about 25,000 species from just one small area. And had he done different ecosystem types, uh, dry forest versus wet forest or different elevations, it would have been much greater than this. So again, uh, look at the, the, the pie slice here is from Jansen's malaise traps. And uh, we're, we're seeing tremendous diversity of Cecidomyas, not only in the temperate zone, but here in the, in the tropics. And so there's every reason to believe that in, indeed, uh, there, there are probably more gall gnats or Cecidomyids than uh, many other orders of, of insects. And you can go down here uh, and you can see that Cecidomyids are hyperdiverse. Um, here's some Hymenoptera, uh, two, two families, ants and Braconid wasps, uh, the curly Curculionids, which we knew were uh, very, very diverse, um, come in fourth here. Now, uh, the, a caveat, obviously, is that malaise traps are not a good way to collect beetles. And, and so we'll return to that. And malaise traps are a great way to collect flies. So uh, I guess the, the take home message here is that flies are exceptionally diverse as are Hymenoptera, likely more diverse uh, than beetles, but, um, it, <laughs> but because beetles aren't very well collect collected, uh, there may be many, many uh, tens of thousands or even millions more insects uh, once we uh, start using uh, molecular data to, to, to sample or we could wait a long time till we have armies and armies of entomologists, but I'm not certain uh, the planet has that much time. So uh, again, this is uh, from his malaise traps and uh, the number of bins, there's almost twice as many uh, of Diptera than Coleoptera and Lepidoptera coming in fourth. But I, I imagine uh, even though malaise traps don't sample beetles very well, that this is probably how things are gonna shake out eventually 
with Dipter being number one, Hymenopter two, and, and Coleopter three, and Lepidopter four. But that remains to be seen. We just don't have uh, enough data yet. I thought I'd share this with you. It's kind of um, Dan's idea, and this is just two days old off of the um, off the press. But basically, his ballpark estimate for tropical uh, for global tropical um, based on his tropical experiences is that. He put uh, the terrestrial eukaryotes at 30 million. Uh, of, of those, at least 65% are insects. And uh, he's not even talking about the oceans or, or microbes. But uh, certainly, we're getting estimates now that, or at least uh, Dan believes that Terry Irwin's original estimate may have been uh, pretty close, actually, which is kind of amazing. Uh, Dan also wanted me to share this with you. He says, uh, say hi to the beetle people for us. I apologize for abandoning Brookity so, so very long ago. He will always be grateful to John Kingsolver and Don Whitehead. And uh, with his bio-alpha program that I mentioned uh, to barcode all the creatures in Costa Rica, he intends to have a special program uh, that will be focused on beetles with uh, beetle appropriate sampling traps and methodologies. I want to switch. Uh, I don't know how much time I have left, but I'd like to talk a little bit about global insect decline, since I've been doing a lot of that over the last two or three years. Probably the, the first major report that raised a red flag for a lot of us was Durso's paper in Science in, in 2014, looking at defaunation in the Anthropocene. This is the first meta-analysis, and basically what he found was that um, of the the taxa examined, uh, which was mostly Coleoptera, again, Hymenoptera, Lepidoptera, dragonflies and damselflies and grasshoppers, that there had been about a 45% mean abundance decline over about a 40 year period. And so the, I, I guess the, the bells didn't, and the whistles didn't really go off for the entomological community until this paper. So this is Holman and it came out in 2017, and this is just a phenomenal result and very meticulous data. I think we can believe this, that there was a 75% decline over 27 years of total insect uh, biomass in Germany. And this is over 60 reserves in Germany, Northwestern Germany, and all of these were in protected areas as opposed to in agriculture, although they were immediately proximate to agriculture in many cases. So this set off just a bevy of uh, news media and, and attention. Um, I don't need to tell any of you about that. Uh, one thing I would like to convey to you is that the, the average rate of decline here is about uh, 2% at the worst and maybe, well, not at the worst, uh, but between maybe one and 2% per year. Uh, this is a very uh, strong decline here, 2% for butterflies in Ohio. Uh, this is surfed flies uh, in the United Kingdom, and I thought I'd throw in some beetles. Uh, Crabbed beetles aren't doing especially well in, in numerous places, uh, particularly where there's a lot of people or where you have high human density or urbanization and what have you. So again, um, we're, we're talking about a 1% to 2% decline. These are some averages here from three, three different studies. I, I can't tell you how hard it is to see a 1% decline with insect populations swinging so wildly between generation. So it's not something that we can perceive or see, and it's even very, very difficult to measure a 1% decline when you have population cycles that are fluctuating by an order of magnitude or maybe two orders of magnitude. And so um, this is a hard problem for us. Now, there's also quite a bit of spatial heterogeneity. So this one to 2% decline, I don't believe is happening over the planet in an even way. And so we don't really know what's going on in wildlands. Most of the reports are coming from areas of extreme high activity, human anth anthropogenic activity or very high human population densities. Uh, this, this graph really shows you kind of what's going on. Uh, what, what's happening in England, for example, where we have, I think this is based on uh, well over 15 million records of occurrence records. In the southern part of England, the decline is steep. It's about three to four percent. 
whereas in the northern part of England or the United Kingdom, moth numbers are actually increasing. And that's perhaps due to climate change and, and milder winters. But that's actually uh, the, the, major, the major pattern here is not all insects are declining and they're not all declining everywhere. This is a, a new paper we have coming out in PNAS in early January. This is looking, this is based on uh, 24 million occurrence records in England and um, many of the species are increasing. Uh, these are the, the green species in, in this plot, but we have a, a very large number that are also decreasing. And I can tell you that oftentimes you have generalists that are increasing in migrants and agricultural pests, uh, whereas the, the taxa with specialized life cycles, uh, like many beetles, uh, are the ones that are suffering the worst and tend to be declining. So these meta-analyses that sum over orders or sum over continents uh, really obscure important detailed information about who's declining and who's increasing. The major threats are the same ones that are affecting all biodiversity. The same things that are affecting large mammals and lizards and birds and what have you. It's habitat loss and degradation. And you, you really need to think a tropical forest deforestation here. And agricultural intensification um, is it, na nature is suffering um, because of we're, we're converting much of the planet surface, particularly that that's arable, into agriculture. And this is particularly true in tropical areas at this point in time. So quite serious. Climate change uh, each year is becoming more and more important. And uh, that's the one that scares me perhaps the most because um, it's happening in places where we don't have high human occupancy. And I'll get back to that in a second. Introduced species are always a problem and something you don't hear very much about, um, but you'll, you'll hear more and more is uh, nitrification. Uh, we're nitrifying the entire planet surface with burning of fossil fuels, but also the manufacture of um, massive amounts of fertilizer by trapping uh, inorganic nitrogen in, and um, putting that into fertilizer all over the planet. There are special insect stressors, pesticides, uh, light pollution. Uh, these are certainly more local stressors as well. I don't think there's any uh, real evidence of, of something un, unseen that we haven't thought about before in terms of causing these declines. But just as one example, where we try to restore habitat for insects, we often get a positive res response. So that sort of suggests that there's not some sort of systemic thing that we can't see or can't measure in the environment causing these declines. It's just having 8 billion people on the planet that's basically the problem uh, for these insects. So the most alarming thing and, and probably uh, not very uplifting, but the thing I wanna share um, is that something might be going on in the tropics that's essentially unmeasured right now. Uh, this is Dan Jansen's sheets uh, from his place in Guanacaste and they're in 1984, uh, 2007, and recently in 2019, I'm he hearing many independent reports. Uh, the worst moth year ever by people in Monte Verde, which are in the cloud forest uh, nearby Guanacaste. Um, this is a new report that came out um, uh, very recently and looking at the decline of caterpillars and their parasitoids at La Selva Biological Station, a much steeper uh, decline than the one to 2% that I mentioned earlier. And you know, this is part of it. We believe with climate change that the, these clouds in the bottom uh, pane are getting pushed up higher and higher on the mountains in habitats that have never before been exposed to low humidities and uh, extended drought and drying periods are, um, getting uh, exposed to physiological conditions that they've never experienced and they have no ability to deal with them. So this is Jansen's primary hypothesis for what's going on at, at his light stations in, in Costa Rica. <clears throat> but I, I would say that uh, these, these humid forests, these rain forests, cloud forests, whether they're on the top of volcanoes in Hawaii or the cloud forests anywhere on the planet and, and many rain forests are, are expensive experiencing and expected to experience droughts that they've never seen before. And I think this is pretty serious. Insects are all, all surface area and very little biomass. And I think drying is a much bigger threat than perhaps just the warming. Some key points uh, from my understanding, 
Uh, we're, we're losing abundant species. So this is no longer a matter of, of losing rare species, but uh, things that are abundant and are really sort of the cornerstones of ecosystem function and ecosystem service are, are declining greatly. Uh, rates of decline go on the order of one to 2% per year. That doesn't sound like much maybe to many of you, but that's basically 10% of the insects removed in a decade. And if you can't play that game very long and, and not have uh, ecosystem um, function uh, difficulties, uh, uh, losing higher trophic levels and what have you. Um, many of the European declines precede climate change in neonic use. And that, that's basically just getting at the idea that, you know, agriculture, deforestation and urbanization and all these things that just happen with a lot of people. Oftentimes it's no single cause, or so there's no single threat or causal factor. And this makes it very, very difficult to, to understand why we're seeing these declines. We don't know what's happening in wildlands. Uh, we don't know what's happening in the tropics, but some of these early reports are frightening. And um, we don't know whether insects are declining faster than other taxa. We know we're in a biodiversity crisis. It can't be otherwise with 8 billion people on the planet. Um, but we do need to know whether or not they're declining faster and why. And I think what I'll do is sort of end there and see if there's questions. Great, thanks a lot, Dave. If you sure. stop sharing your screen, yeah, maybe I'm, we can get I'm Carlos back. Yeah, got it. So I think what I'll do is I'll just let you and Carlos kind of free form, answer any questions and answers or have any more discussions. And I'll turn my mic and camera off. However, in about eight minutes, we'll probably have to come back and shut it down so we can prepare for uh, the next stage of our meeting. Okay. okay. Do you have any questions that were submitted that you want to start with? Oh, sorry. Yeah, just click click open your Q and A, and mm -hmm. I didn't look ahead, but there's uh, probably a few in there we can. Uh, I guess here here's one from Claire. What was the genetic barcoding method used? 18s or CL1 gene? So maybe we can start with that, and I'll let you take it away. Yeah, it's all CL1 at this point. CL1 is becoming a standard. It's not necessarily the best. It's just it's something that everybody's agreeing to do. And that's what the Canadian barcode facility is, is geared up to do. So it, it's, not, it's not perfect in any way, it's just a standard. So um, let's see if there's any other questions. Carlos, do you have any that you wanna tackle? Dave, I just noticed that we've lost Carlos. So okay. you're, you're yeah. going to solo. Well, one thing I didn't explain are what bins are. And so um, bins are determined by a computer algorithm. So we take all these CL1 sequences, we call them haplotypes, and then we have a clustering algorithm. And this, this is done once a week with uh, millions upon millions of barcodes from across the planet and from across the tree of life. And the clustering algorithm uh, puts like barcodes together and um, then uh, tests these algorithmically to see if they're actually distinct enough to be given their own number. And so they're then assigned an arbitrary number that can be used to track any other information like that that should come in to uh, the genetic databases, whether they're GenBank or a uh, European database or the Barcodes of Life database. And so no data is, is ever lost again. They're, they're sort of glommed on or curated or grouped with this, this cluster. But those clusters are actually reanalyzed and, uh, and reevaluated almost on a weekly basis based on new information or the information for systematists. Every once in a while, a systematist will say, hey, these two barcodes look like they're, or these two clusters look like they should be um, put together and because of hybridization or uh, just the opposite is more likely the case. When we have host data, we often find that something that looks like one cluster should actually be two and it gets pulled apart and curated in that fashion.
Any other questions? So um, there's one here about the declines of birds. And so uh, this is actually something I addressed in my annual review article about insect decline. Um, there are declines of birds and there are declines of grassland birds and what have you. Uh, for the most part, we are not seeing a signal that the insect decline is driving the bird decline. Uh, they're bo both declining about in sync but there was a, a very famous or uh, high profile study of bird numbers in North America. And over about the last 30 years, we've lost, uh, I think, uh, 3 billion birds uh, from where we were uh, three decades ago. And if you look at what birds are declining, there's insectivores that are declining, but the insectivores, many groups of insectivores are declining, but not just the insectivores. Or the signal, the signal was really across uh, frugivores, insectivores, waterfowl, and what have you. And so there's not yet a strong signal. The one, the one thing that I think is a caveat here is that the aerial insectivores, so the, the swifts, um, I'm trying to think of some others, some of the things like martins and these, these birds that feed on the wing and are insectivores, they're among the most rapidly declining bird lineages on the planet. But they're not declining everywhere, for example. And, and again, this is a very important point that there's quite a bit of spatial heterogeneity in where these things are declining and where they're not. And in the Northern Hemisphere right now, I would say that things are declining where you'd expect them to be declining. In, in Northern Europe, where you have 250 people or 300 people living per square kilometer, you have a lot of biodiversity declining. Um, other places, say Canada, with four people per square kilometer or what have you, or Western North America, many of these insects and many of these lineages are still increasing. The, the, the big unknown and the thing I think we should all be worried about is some of this new data from the tropics. So Dave, yeah, do you want to take a look at Claire Winfield's question, given Jan's idea of low thermal tolerance in the tropics versus temperate zone, and Kimberly Sheldon's work on these two, is there any empirical evidence that tropical insects might also be declining faster than temperate insects due to climate change? I have something to say, because actually I didn't talk about my research with Terry in La Selva, but we have a laboratory where we're actually measuring fitness of insects fitness of beetles under predicted global warming. And we have a simulation of the temperatures along this tropical mountain. And then when people talk, like Kimberly Sheldon, they are measuring this kind of thermal tolerances of the temperatures at which insects faint. But the temperature at which you faint is not the temperature at which you start declining. You need to actually understand fitness. And that's what we are doing in this project we started with, with Terry. And then one thing that I wanted to tell Claire that I actually discovered, I have this, I, I gave this, uh, uh, this seminar for AMNAT for the, uh, for American naturalists, where we actually have experiments where we showed that you have this fitness that our fitness is adapted to different elevations. But then when I was looking at the literature, there's only one paper that measures fitness in a latitudinal gradient. And then I requested to PNA the original data for that paper. This is Dutch, a famous paper that everybody cites. And I found out that the data that they have for the tropical species is only for eight species. And all of them are pests that were raised in the laboratory and they use the original location where the pests were collected generations before. And they use that as a location and they use the fitness estimated in the laboratory, let's say in Africa for an insect that is from South America and so on. So the truth is we don't have any idea. If you really look at the data, we have these temperatures at which insects faint as an estimation of how tolerant they are to different temperatures. And if you want to really understand fitnesses, uh, understand climate, how climate change will affect these populations, you have to calculate fitness and the data that we have so far, so far I discovered that is super bogus. I mean, I'll just uh, say something for 20 seconds. 
Uh, temperate insects ex experience really wild fluctuations compared to tropical insects. So I, I think Jansen, Jansen probably has a good hypothesis and he's an ex exceedingly gifted naturalist who has tremendous insight into how organisms work and the interactions among them. But I will say, I wanna go back to uh, more than temperature. I think hydrology and uh, desiccation are going to be deal breakers for many species on this planet, uh, particularly insects with their huge surface area to volume ratios. And so it's these droughts in the tropics, I think that are really gonna affect plants and insects, perhaps even before temperature. Great. Thank you to both Carlos and Dave for a wonderful uh, presentation, really engaging with everyone. Um, and uh, I, I hope that everyone will join me maybe in the chat with a uh, rounding applause for such a wonderful plenary talk. So thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Super nice. Thanks for inviting us. That was super fun. It was great to have you. Okay.